righty. So with that being said, for those who don't know who you are, and I'm sure most of the people on my channel do know who you are, but for those who don't, can you tell us who you are and what it is that you do? Yeah. So my name is Demetrius. And um, basically, I, aside from editing, I do editing on the side. I do my YouTube channel and uh, Patreon. So I guess you could say I'm a sartorialist. I guess you could uh, put it in in those words. I teach people how to find their own personal style and the philosophy behind style and also promoting the traditional crafts. I think the traditional crafts are so important. And that was more of a recent realization. And I, I definitely want the channel to go and kind of go in that direction as well in traditional crafts. But for now, it's teaching people how to find their own personal style and also a little bit of image consulting. So yeah, I guess you could say that. So film editor and image consultant, let's put mm. it that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, is this is this your full-time job working YouTube and Patreon? Yeah, I guess you could say it is full-time. Yeah. Um, the editing is more on the side and yeah, I mean, it takes all my time and it doesn't make much right now, but you know, it's getting there. And I, I just started hitting the algorithm. It started blessing me finally. So hopefully we'll see where that goes. But right now I decided, you know what, I'm going to put all my uh, heart and soul into this because I really do believe it'll take off. So yeah, full time. Okay. So I do want to spend a little bit more time talking to you about like what you think goes into somebody finding their own personal style. But for right now, I want to kind of discuss how it is that you became interested in menswear in the first place. I think we could probably even make it a little bit more narrow and say classic menswear. I think that's an appropriate designation, but what has kind of been your style journey or trajectory? How did you find yourself getting involved in this? If I'm using this word correctly, this community? Right. Um, so technically, if we want to be technical about it, it goes all the way back to when I was a toddler. I love dressing up in a suit and tie and all that stuff. Just it didn't matter what the occasion is. I love to dress up. I thank my mama for raising me with that kind of uh, Italian, you know, uh, ethos of dressing well. But um, I guess you would say it started in the sartorial thing because I, I went off the rails uh, so much as later in life uh, when it comes to style. Um, but as I got back into dressing up, I guess you would say that it happened in college, the second college I went to, um, I pretty much just one day I, I was watching alpha M I found him. It, I guess you could say it really started with one of my buddies in college. He dressed really nice. And I went, wow, like you always look good. And it was more street style, but still he was put together and I looked like a bum. So <laughs> I went, you know what? I, I really need a step up my game he was really uh smooth with the ladies so i thought that would help too uh and then i so i started looking at the stuff uh found jordan o'brien uh he was mainly uh focused on hairstyles so i got into hair first and then i found alpha m uh aaron marino and that really changed my perspective on things and one day i came into school wearing a i brought to my dorms uh one week i brought uh, a, a sport coat. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to see how the suit thing is, right? Because everyone's seen the power of a suit. And the suits before that I wore were horrid, right? Thrifted suits that didn't fit at all. But this one did, this uh, jacket did. I don't know where the hell I got it, but I had it. So I, I put it on and I really like it totally changed the way I felt at school. And it got me into a different mindset of really putting in the effort. And instead of a backpack, I, I got a leather uh, case and a leather bag and I started carrying my stuff in there. And it just, my mindset, it just like, it flicked the switch. And I went, oh my gosh, like this really works. <laughs> the, like changing your appearance really does uh, put you in a different mindset, so to speak. And so after that, I, it, it became not an obsession, but something I, when I get into something, I really get into something. So I, I delved more into it and more into it. And what started off more in how good do I look became more a question of what do I want to represent? What is this saying about me? And then later it became more of the craftsmanship that's involved in it. Um, because before I just shop at ASOS and anywhere that's cheap, but then I really started to get into the, the artistry 
so to speak, of what it is to be in a sartorial world, right? And all the things that are kind of connected to craftsmanship, traditional craftsmanship. So I guess you would say that's that's how it started. I've been doing it for years. Um, horrible for most of the time. Uh, finally, hopefully just starting to get the groove of things uh, in my own style. But yeah, I guess that's how it started in college. And then just put it one day putting on a sport coat and realizing that, bam, this is a this is a game changer. So what made you want to reach for a sport coat in the first place? Was it something that you saw on Alpha M, Aaron Marino, correct? Aaron Marino? Uh, you Is that know what? I think, yeah, yeah, Aaron Marino. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So was it a yeah. video of his that inspired you to like seek out specifically sport coats or was it something else? It was just kind of the suit culture in general. Um, mm. But I didn't have a good suit at that time. I had one black suit, but... You know, a black suit it, it, for special occasions and stuff like that, you know. So this uh, jacket is like a, I guess you'd say shark skin, kind of that mm. grayish tone, kind of similar to the color you have on now. Had uh, standard notch lapels, very, very basic, right? Um, but before I really knew what kind of style uh, details I, I wanted in a uh, jacket, right? But still basic enough to where it looked really good. It fit me really well. Um, and that was the thing I had in my closet, apparently, uh, aside from some old 80 suits that my <laughs> friends were my friend's dads. I used to just said, here you go. Take these. I don't know when I got those either. Um, but yeah, I, it was just in my closet and I went, oh, I like this. And then I, I eventually in college, I got my first like good suit, which was suit supply. And that mm -hmm. was like that. That's when I went, OK, this is this is hot. <laughs> this is freaking awesome. You know, so yeah, but that was the first one. And the last suit I actually had, I haven't, I, I'm in, I'm, I'm looking to get a new suit finally, because mostly I just get sport coats because they're, I find it more with my uh, personal style. Sports coats. Yeah. I, um, I only have, well, I should say had two suits. So I have one currently and I just sold one on eBay. So I had a pinstripe suit from, um, suit supply but i saw that i, I, saw I that. honestly that wore nice. it like once once in the last two years i think so i was like well this is just taking up space and i like yeah. you i prefer sport coats i think it just works better because i prefer a kind of more business casual look as a as opposed to you know purely business with it with the suit exactly um, yeah, yeah 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 it's same with me because it's like it, it, sometimes you just go this seems too occasion based like a, you know, a suit can tend to look occasion based depending on how it's styled. So yeah, it, it's way easier. I, I find to wear like just the jacket and odd yeah. trousers, jeans or whatever else you have. It's, it's way easier. I think it might also be the kind of suits that I had because they were both double breasted peak lapels, which are probably like the most formal as far as suits go, you can get yeah. apart from yeah. like a shawl collar tuxedo or something like that. Right. Yeah. But um, I, I want a suit, but I want it to be casual. You know, so yep. I'm thinking about investing in a casual suit, something that's single breasted with patch pockets, you know, probably a light gray or something like that, that I could just wear very, very casually. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That That's something I've been that that's going to be my next suit double. Well, OK, this sounds a little contradictory, but I want a casual double breasted suit. But I'm when I mean casual, I'm talking no padding, no canvas, nothing like that. I want it to look like I'm wearing a normal jacket. If I'm, you know what I mean? Like if it's just wearing the actual suit jacket, I don't want the silhouette to look suit like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you like, want something very softly tailored. Yeah. Full blown ne Neapolitan, Neapolitan. Like I love yeah. what they do in Naples. That's phenomenal. So something like that. Um, but it's going to, yeah, it's going to cost. So I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> as, it, know, as, like, it does, hey, as it does, as it does. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any idea as far as like what fabrics or what kind of patterns you want? So, yeah, I, I'm not the kind of guy to wear like a lot of pattern for a full suit. Right. Like, mm. uh, obviously, this is, uh, you know, sport coat and it's got window pane on it. But most of the time, I like when I, I think of my ideal suit. Right. Um, it, it's plain uh, in a summer fabric. And I live in Michigan, so it's not like it's it's hot here all the throughout the years. But the thing is, for me, at least, I realize that I wear more summer clothes throughout the year than not, um, because it's like it's 
really hot in the summer and you'd say mid spring. Right. And then by the time like October, mid October, it's like, then I start putting on the layers. Right. And then it gets cold before, you know, and it's winter. So like an all season, like, you know, the four season fabrics or whatever, it, it's, that don't work here because I'm not going to get that much use out of it. So I, my thing is if I get something that I can wear in the heat of the summer, I can always layer up that or wear it with like a turtleneck. If it's not too, uh, too summery, the fabric, I can always, you know, wear it with a, with a warmer top. Right. And keep myself warm, but it's harder to keep yourself cool. So I, I would go probably with a, um, either a more tropical wool or you know what, maybe oh, I love seersucker. If it's a plain colored seersucker without the stripes, it's like, Ooh, Ooh, that looks really cool. So like in a Navy or a, um, or like a teal, like a dark teal. I really like that in linen, mm -hmm. maybe even so linen seersucker or a very, uh, tropical open weave wool, if that's possible. So something like that, not cotton, I, I'm not the biggest fan of cotton. I, I can't get, <laughs> I can't get the crease in the trousers with with the cotton, and so I went forget it. I got those, yeah. you know, uh, Calaro trousers, which I love. Don't don't get me wrong, I freaking love them. Um, but because I chose, I, I decided to go cheap and get uh, cotton. You know, I'm constantly to get a crease. I'm constantly ironing these things, and I hate it. I'm like, I'm doing this. Every day I want to wear these suckers. I gotta, I gotta iron it if I want that crease to look crispy. And so yeah. I want to forget it, forget it. No more cotton for me. I'm too like anal about those details. Like if I don't see a, if I see a break in the knee, I get like upset. Like it sounds <laughs> stupid, but I just there's something about it. I'm like, I, it's gotta, I, it's gotta look smooth. So uh, and I've come to appreciate wool once I realize that I haven't ironed my wool trousers from Suit Supply since I, since I got them and they still hold a crease perfect. And I went, you gotta be kidding me. Like, I don't uh, wear it often, but when I used to, I, I realized, so I'm like, oh my gosh, I never iron these. I love wool. So now I love wool because it's like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's yeah, hardly any maintenance. It might cost more, but the maintenance goes down dramatically. So yeah, yeah but first suit, um, or this next one. Yeah. Total Southern Italian style. Uh, plain color in a uh, summery fabric and probably teal, like a dark teal. I love that. It's like, it, is it green? Is it blue? I don't know. You know, it's it, that. Color. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I go for. <laughs> that's cool. So I want to take a step back for a second and talk a little bit more about your kind of first experience wearing your sport coat or suit on a college campus. What was the reaction of your peers when you started dressing that way? So every, so I was in my film classes and all, all my friends that were uh, girls in the class were like, Ooh, you look good. Oh, I love those. So I, I did the whole sock thing, you know, the fun sock. So they really liked that. Now I look back and go, yeah, you know, but <laughs> like back in that time, they, they loved it. Um, I got a lot of compliments from the ladies, uh, which was nice. Um, the guys, my homeboys, they, they were like, Oh, you look good. You know, they didn't, they didn't think anything of it, really. Actually, though, one friend of mine, Eric, he really got inspired by it. And he went, I love that jacket you got. On. And so then the next day, and he always, we called him Charlie Brown because he always wore, he was a short dude, uh, wore a Charlie Brown t-shirt, right? And then one day he comes in with a sport coat, these great jeans and a briefcase in the school. And he goes, gentlemen, and we're like, Bro, that's that's Eric. Like, and he looked great. And so I was like, I really felt happy because he really um he's he's from Detroit and he really brought himself up there to that next level and stuff. And he was inspired by the way I dressed. So that in turn is what I think too uh made me decide to actually do um the YouTube channel because I always wanted to go into YouTube, but I didn't know what. And this was that moment was the moment I went, I, I think this is it. I think this is what I want to do. Um, because it felt really good to help somebody, but um, yeah, everyone in and my teachers really liked it. They they usually really liked it. My professors. Um, and then one day when I came in, and I guess I did it for so long that one day I came in with jeans, a leather biker jacket, t-shirt, you know, and a cap, 
And my, my one professor, he's like, I've never seen you this casual in my life. He's like, this is weird. And I'm trying to adjust to this. He's like, well, this is weird. Um, but you know, it was everyone, uh, they liked it. It seemed, I, I, I don't think anyone was laughing. Like if they were, it was by my back and oh, well, but you know, it, it, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it seemed like, uh, it was quite the compliment giver. Not that that's important. And it's actually something I, I actually, honestly, when I'm, it, in public, I tend not to like, like if people are like, Oh, you, oh, oh, that's nice. Oh, wow. Like, it's like, okay, just get on with your business, you know? Uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it was, it was good. The peers were good and professors liked it. So I, I think mm-hmm. it actually, it was really beneficial, especially with, uh, if I want to talk to a professor about something or someone in higher in the hierarchy, right. It really, uh, really helped have your, um, what you said carried a little bit more value and importance just by the way you dress. So, because it's like, okay, if he's presenting himself like this, you know, putting the time to look good and look respectful, they tend to respect you more. So yeah, Mm. that's kind of the reaction I got from it. So you said a couple interesting things there. The first thing I want to touch on is the fact that you went to film school. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later and how that um, influences the style of your videos on YouTube, because they definitely have a cinematic cinematic quality, which I greatly, greatly appreciate. And obviously, so do many others. But do you think that there is some connection between the fact that you were in film school and the reaction of your peers? So what I'm getting at is that film school is very artistic. Uh, you guys are probably used to people wearing costumes that probably naturally comes with that territory. So the fact that you went on and one day you're, you know, wearing a sport coat or wearing a suit, wearing something that might be very starkly contrast to what you've worn previously, it probably wouldn't be as astonishing to your peers because you guys do have that background. You, you know what? That's true. So the thing is, it's It's film school, but it's not like a film school. I went to a university which had a film program, but it was Mm -hmm. the best in the country. So Mm -hmm. we made at the end. Where was this, by the way? uh, Madonna University. It's in Livonia, Michigan. And we we go to California. I went to Hollywood. Uh, We made a full-length feature film, and we went through the whole thing. It went in theaters. uh, We wrote the script. We had a producer, executives, all that. Um, and people from the industry working on it. So we got the full experience that you normally don't even find in a lot of film schools. It was it was phenomenal um, and, and great connections. But yeah, so I think especially in that, I, I will say that most people just kind of dress, you know, normal in, in the film school. But definitely, I think that artistic element really does help people appreciate it more. Because I know for a fact that my style not only is influenced by the sartorial sphere, it's really influenced by film and what you see in film. So, you know, especially a lot of uh, uh, like the, uh, like Goodfellas is a huge style inspiration for me. Um, Just that mafia films in general, but um, definitely, I think you're right about that, that it it would be more appreciative because actually I did have a, um, uh, someone in my class, classes who would always dress up. I don't recommend it. She dressed in, um, in like tutus and, and like children's costumes. Don't ask me why, but still, yes, the environment was there where it was like, okay, she's a grown adult in a fairy costume. <laughs> okay. But you know, so, but you know what I mean? It, it's going to, so they're not going to care <laughs> if, if yeah. they don't care about that. And they're like, Oh, you look cute today. You know, they're definitely not going to care that I'm, you know, wearing a sport coat, but uh, yeah, I do think. Yeah, that I suppose, it, I suppose it would be quite odd if the fairy was judging the businessman in a suit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that would I, hold up, hold up. Yeah. But no, I, you're right. I, I definitely think that would, uh, or definitely did have a different reaction um, because of my other classes. Um, my one uh, professor, uh, she was from Italy though. So she loved it when I came mm-hmm. in dressed up in a, you know, a double breasted jacket. But some people were just kind of like, huh? Like what's the occasion or why you dressed up like that? But not really, but it, definitely I had the most um, support, I guess you would say, or positive reactions and letting me know in my film uh, in the film sphere. Definitely. 
Yeah, it would seem like people who have a artistic temperament would definitely be, you know, more open to people being unique in the way that they dress. For I sure. guess that's where I was going with that. So you said something yeah. also interesting there, which segues to the next question I wanted to ask you. And I suspected before even knowing this about you that there was a connection between your personal style and your experience in the film industry. So you said that, you know, film is a great inspiration for your personal style. And you mentioned a couple of the films. Can you talk about those films and in particular, how they influenced your unique style? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've been in the film as long as I can remember, like even at three years old, I was like a, already a film geek. And, and um, it started for me, at least the love of film was when I watched extended edition Lord of the Rings and how they made it. And I went, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is what I want to go into. And, but when it, and so it, it was always influential in other aspects, but when it came to style, definitely um, I think one of the, biggest ones because a lot of times if you're doing like let's say a historical film it's a little harder to you know find inspiration from that so if i'm watching the mask of zorro right it's like okay tony and there is dressing all black awesome i <laughs> guess i could take inspiration from them in some way but get a yourself hard. a cape <laughs> right exactly yeah uh but you know uh, when it comes to the films that really inspired definitely goodfellas i'd say was number one um because i i love Italian knit shirts. Hence why I'm wearing one. So I, in that movie, I mean, the first time you see Henry Hill is an adult, right? And it has that shot going up and he's like smoking outside, you know, and uh, leaning on the car, the most badass entry. And he's gotten a beautiful Italian knit on, right? And I fell in love with that. And definitely, gosh, I mean, there's, there's other films, definitely. Um, the Gentleman is a, uh, that's a more modern, recent one, but that is the most, I say, recent film that inspired me to kind of change it up a bit. Um, I did a video on it. And I mean, especially, um, oh my gosh, Matthew McConaughey style. Oh my gosh. I was never into buttoning up uh, my polo shirts. I like to show as much <laughs> chess as possible. It's, that, it's very it's Italian. Very to me. Italian. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, that's Sicilian to me, but I, but he buttons it all the way and it's a very British thing, but he pulled it off so well that the, a few days ago, I, I was wearing a black polo with a jacket and I, first time I ever did it, I put it all the way uncomfortable a bit. I'm not used to having things buttoned up. I never wear a tie, but mm. it was definitely something actually I could, I could get with this. I could get with this. So uh, The Gentleman, um, Goodfellas, a few of the old films even. um, Oh, my gosh. I I can't believe I'm having a mind fart here. But no, that's all right. Could you just talk a little bit about like uh, like how they specifically influenced your style? You said that you really like the Italian knits and that was inspired by Goodfellas. But can you think of any other ways that specific movies inspired your style? So a lot of times it's not just the outfits that a character. I like that. I'm going to try and see what I can take from that. It's the attitude and the characters themselves that Mm. inspire me to say, I want to dress like that. It's not merely what they're wearing. So if let's say, for example, if the first time I saw an Italian knit and it was on some idiot in a film, right? This cowardly, stupid guy that no one would want to emulate. Most likely as cool as they look, there would be a part of me that would refrain from it because Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, and and this just comes down to style in general i don't think a lot of people realize this but a lot of what we like is not as influenced by the actual forms the material forms themselves but the connotations they bring so and it's a huge it's a huge thing um or else we'd be dressing way more out there than most people do um Mm -hmm. so definitely uh I would say that it's the characters specifically. And I always thought Henry Hill was, I mean, he's, I mean, he's a mafia guy, right? No one to emulate, but I won't say I'm not tempted by that kind of life, but like, (laughs) um, but still he he had an air about him that was really cool. And so Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, that's influential. Catch me if you can that um, Leo wears an Italian knit and that awesome awesome Italian knit. And he's got that attitude where he's like, this guy can get away with anything. Right. And he's so Mm -hmm. confident about it. So that definitely uh, helped at least with the Italian knit. So 
I'd say it, when it comes to films, it it's not yeah, it's not just the outfits themselves. It's the characters and people you you kind of want to be like, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. Yeah, there's something about that person that you're like, I wish I could be like that. And so you'll take what you can. And sometimes mm. it's style uh, because it's kind of like you're putting that person on you. Right. So if there's like a if there's a piece, a garment that is specifically from a movie. Right. When you put that on, you, you'll feel it that you, you're kind of donning that person's armor on yourself. And so it's like it, and it, it's very powerful. It can be. So we, you just got to be careful of and, and realize what that garment does to you, because there's some pieces that actually might make you start at, acting like a douchebag like there, like i'll be honest there's one uh jacket i have and it's very bold it's white with um it's a blazer right it's a summer blazer it's knitted a knitted kind like a loose weave kind it's great with really bold like boater stripes on it and when i wear that the connotation with it is such a middle finger because it's so bold you know what I mean? It's kind of like I can do whatever I want. It, it gives me that feeling of like I can do whatever I want. And I had to recognize that and not let myself get cocky when I wear it. I know it sounds weird, but there is some it can happen, like it, depending on how you put something together, how you dress. It can really change your attitude for better or for worse. So it's something to definitely be aware of. And something I found um, having to be aware of. I know that it kind of went off from the original the uh, question but still something that you know it's kind of important I, I don't know i think so yeah no worries um that's really fascinating to me um without embarrassing yourself too much can you think of some examples of behavior that you've exhibited when you've worn that particular jacket not like it's not like to the point where i'd have a story to say but it's more how i felt Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. I know there were points, and I think one of them, when I was, I believe I was probably wearing it when I was smoking a cigar with friends and some dude. Of course. Came, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> and, and some guy and some young punk came up trying to impress us and impress me. I never met him before. And he was wearing a fake Rolex and I called him out on it. I was so open about it. I'm like, who are you? Like, I mean, it was just like, <laughs> I was really, I was really, and I, I didn't care how uncomfortable he got. And I was like, you weren't, I went, no, that's bullshit. That's fake. I just sat right there. Cause he was like showing everyone the wow, wow, wow. And he showed me, I was like, that's, that's fake dude. What, what are you trying to do? And so I don't know me. I think I was wearing that when I did that, that could have influenced. I mean, then again, that's me. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely gonna, I'm definitely um open about how I feel about something, but I can't, if I was wearing that blazer at that, at that specific time that I did that, then I think that influenced it a little more for me to go a little bit more beyond. Um, mm. Cause yeah, but it, I can't think of embarrassing stories. I think it was more just how I felt and I was battling it. Like, like humble yourself there, dude. Like, you know, as you're wearing it, because I remember one time I was wearing it in the summer and these, we were on the water and these girls came by and in very small bikinis and they're on the floaty on the water and they kept looking up and trying to get my attention. And I was kind of like, Oh yeah. But then I had to like, catch yourself, dude. You're not, you're not hot shit. <laughs> you know, you're, you're definitely not hot shit. So don't pre think that you are. So it can, sometimes I think that, like I said, it's, it's something you just have to, uh, for me at least, yeah, nothing embarrassing, just something I had to be constantly aware of when wearing it. It went away because I, I noticed it so much that I went the connotation more changed now to just boating and sailing. And so I went, okay, it's a little bit more of a wholesome uh, connotation. <laughs> right. So, and, and then it, uh, then it kind of shifted. So you can do that, but you just got to make sure. Yeah. The connotation. Now I'm, re now I'm reminded of that Saturday night. Was it Saturday? I was going to say Saturday night live. I feel like that's incorrect. I'm saying this incorrect. Anyway, there was a song on that show. It's like Boats and Hose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what came to mind when you were telling yeah. that story. No. Yep. You got your rowing blazer. You got some 
yeah, some fine yeah. women who some fine who women would want to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. be derogatory what? might call hoes on right. rap, yeah. you know <laughs> you know what's actually funny i i said as much as i'm into the like the suited culture and stuff when i when i i, I love being on the water i love it but to be honest like i go it, it it kind of doesn't go because I love dressing up in like the boater kind of outfits, but to me, a, a real good time on the water is with an old wooden fishing boat with like an old Greek guy and just <laughs> fishing with the net, like not yachts. Like a, I'm, I, I might want to dress for a yacht, but I don't want to do like a uh, yacht's cool and all, but it's like, when I think of like boating, it's like, I don't know, listening to some bazooki music with some rakia and like fishing with a net and an old papu over there you know, <laughs> from the old country and like catching octopus or something. But no, yeah, yeah it's a good time. Yeah. So you said something very interesting there as well, which, uh, to be honest, I had not considered until you said it, which is that sometimes people's personal style can be a reflection of the people that they hold in esteem, whether yeah. that's in a fictional world, such as, you know, a film or in real life. And I was thinking about like my own personal style. I don't, I don't know that I could say that I have a personal style that I've developed one as yet because I'm still very new in menswear. But I've noticed that as of late, I've really started to, to develop an interest in like 90s style and particular yeah. things about 90s style. And I think that that's partly a reflection of my watching and re-watching the HBO series called City on a Hill. Have you seen it? No, I have not seen City on a Hill. Heard of it. Okay. You have to yeah, promise me that you're going to watch that shit. It's I will. incredible. I will. Awesome. But what I'm right. what I'm getting at here as far as style is concerned is that there's two characters. There's a character who is a kind of corrupt FBI agent whose name is Dra Jackie Rohr. And there is a DA, wait, yeah, DA whose name is Peter... I want to say Peter Dorsey, but I feel like that's the Fox News, Fox News correspondent. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the Corsi Ward, that's it, the Corsi Ward. Okay. Anyway, the point that I'm getting at here is that the series is set in the 90s, and I really love Jackie Rohr's character because he does have that kind of carefree attitude and fuck everybody attitude. And mm -hmm. he wears shirts much like the one that I'm wearing here with these kind of like stripes or you know, the wide stripes, which were very common in the 90s. And I'm starting to think like maybe lately why I've been so fascinated by these kind of shirts is because I associate them with somebody I hold in, in esteem in this fictional world in Jackie Rohr. But yeah, yeah. that's fascinated. I didn't think about it till then. Yeah, because you know what? It, it happened too. Like I, I, I hated why, like I hated the eighties blazers, right. in the eighties suits and stuff. I absolutely hated them, but recently I've been going, okay, they're okay. They're okay. And then I realized that my fascination with the eighties has gone up as well. So I, I was like, okay, this is clearly the, one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm starting to like that style. It's more because of the, because I'm starting to like the eighties as a whole. So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, mm -hmm. that eighties aesthetic, obviously you're going to like something about it, or you're going to loosen up about it and go, okay, it's not as bad as I thought. Right. If you like something kind of like someone you meet, like if you really like somebody and they're wearing something that normally you would find ridiculous, if it's on someone that you admire, you go, Okay, yeah, he can pull it off. If he wasn't wearing it, you'd be like, that looks like garbage. But if it's someone you admire, you go, okay, he can pull it off. Yeah. So it really does. Yeah. I it, that's probably one of the biggest reasons because it's it, I mean, think about it. Like I love uh ancient Greek style clothing. I'd love to wear an imation, but I'm not gonna wear it because it's you know, not with these You're times. gonna have to translate, you're gonna have to translate for it, your so American in, fellow. Yeah, an imation, or I guess you would say in English is hemation. I'm guessing it's it, it's what m most people call a toga when they speak mm. of ancient Greece. It's not a toga. Toga is specifically Roman, um, but in ancient Greek, imation is a it's a cloth, a rectangular cloth, and you see it on all the statues where it's wrapped above one shoulder. Usually, there's no no shirt underneath. There can be a tunic underneath, and then it's wrapped around the arm. And I I love the look of it. I love the flow of it and stuff. And I realize too, maybe it's because of my my greekness you know maybe that's why i really like this too and not other cultures that have something similar but i'm not as anyway 
So, and it's the same with, um, I think the biggest realization was when I realized I love earth tones and darker, like I love color, but when it comes to sartorial style and like classic menswear, I like the more subdued colors. Mm. But, but when it comes to like medieval clothing, because I have a fascination for fashion throughout like all of history, right? But when it comes to like medieval, let's say Greek clothing, I love it when it's super bright. I love how it was all bright and colorful, like mega rich colors, right? But I don't like that if it was on modern clothing. And I realized, okay, so it can't just be that I like, you know, bright colors or I just like earth tone colors. It depends on what culture is wearing it and the connotations with it. You, I hope I'm saying that in a way that's kind of clear, but definitely I was like, okay, because yeah, I, I'm, if, if you wore the same colors and, and, and patterns that you find on a medieval Byzantine person's, you know, uniform, if you translate that directly to modern clothing, it would look ridiculous. And the only reason mm-hmm. it looks ridiculous is because of the way your mind works and how you're not used to seeing it in that with that connotation, right. And in, in within that culture and time frame, So yeah, really interesting. And the more I think we, you get in tune with that, the more easy it's going to be to find what you like, what you don't and why you'll wear something or it'll stop you from getting into the mistake, which I did before where I liked how something looked, I bought it and then I never wore it. And I regret it. And it's like, why? But it's like, because of the connotation it has, or because it's like, I bought a blazer, for example, and it's brown with like, it's a boating blazer with stripes, you know, it's kind of clown looking. I loved it when I saw it. I, actually, I was originally going to sell it, buy it and then sell it. Um, but I decided to keep it. And I've only worn it for like one video and twice outside of uh filmmaking and i realized i never wore it again because it might look cool in italy like if i was in southern italy it would look great but where i'm living it's too much and it's like ah okay. what does that mean though so it, why would it look good in one place and not the other because it's more reflective of the culture that it's in so for example if in southern italy where even the buildings are colorful right like if you're like in Naples and it's just, it's expected in the culture. It's very mm-hmm. Neapolitan, this jacket. Um, it's something you'd wear around the water because it is a, a blazer. Um, and it feels like it would belong at Piti Uomo or, or Naples or Southern, anywhere in Southern Italy, Sicily even, but, but not here. I'm in the Midwest. Um, yes, I am in a nautical culture, so I can get away with it more than someone, let's say in Utah. Right. Uh, Just because of the nautical nature of where I live, but still it's too much. And the connotation is going to be different. Like people are going to be like, that looks like a clown jacket. That wouldn't be what people would think in my, in in Italy, but here Mm. you're going to get a lot of that. Same with them. I was wearing them. I love it still, but I I have a overcoat or a coat and it's got, you know, the sash on it. Right. And I, I wear the belt with it. And a lot of people here go kind of bathrobe looking where I got inspector gadget kind of, you know, detective looking because <laughs> the belt, you know, it's like, cause that's the closest thing they can think of. If they were in some place, even New York, I think people wouldn't think that, right. Because it's a more stylish area. Um, but here it's like people immediately think of the closest looking thing that they can think of kind of like even colors. If I was to wear, let's say a, green jacket with purple people are going to think of the joker you know what i mean so it's like that's why it's like and so the more you're aware of that the more you can i feel make less mistakes uh in putting things together and buying things unless you don't care and you want to change that perception so with like the slash the coat i have with the the raglan coat with the with the belt you know cloth belt I don't care that it like it's cool enough for me to bear that connotation of bathrobe. You know, I'd rather just be like, actually, this is just a more traditional thing, yada, yada. And people go and change their minds versus having my my style be determined by other people's thoughts. It's a balancing act. Right. Mm. Because sometimes you don't want it. Because for me, at least clothing is a lot too about respect, being respectful dressing respectfully and sometimes if you go way too far 
then it becomes disrespectful because all the eyes are on you. You know what I mean? And it's like, it, it's, it's, it's hard though, because of course today, everyone is so casual that it's like, even if you look halfway decent, all eyes might be on you, you know? Yeah. And, so I was going to say, exp- explain that out a little bit more. So in what, in what sense is it disrespectful? If you, if I understand you correctly, what you're suggesting is if you like stand out too much, you're pulling away too much attention and what, in what sense is that disrespectful? So, because it's, one, I or is think it, is it, is it based on circumstance as well? Yeah, it's definitely based on circumstance. So for example, I made a change when I go to church, I'm Orthodox. So it's when I'm going to church, you know, I decided to dress more in traditional black. Um, so that's what all I've been wearing mostly, or at least I wear this jacket a lot. If I'm going to wear one, I wear uh, black trousers. Um, one time I wore like white corduroy pants. Right. And it got a lot of attention. And someone at church is like, oh, those quarter. Oh, look at that. Hey, did you see Demetrius's, uh, you know, pants are so nice. And I went, this is not the right place to, to do that. Right. Because it's not about me. If I'm at church, it's about Christ. So I went, OK, that's d- too much on me. Don't want that. I'm sticking out too much. Um, whereas black, you can blend in a little bit. Even if you're wearing something super nice, you can't see all the details quite as easily, especially if it's dimly lit right? Like mine is, um, where it's mostly by candles. So, you know, it's it. And then let's say you're, um, just, I don't know, maybe at an event where you're not the main focus, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you're dressing in something that is so out there. Right. And two, you want it to be more about the clothing should reflect you, but also not just you, the best parts of you and Mm -hmm. also reflect your character. And if your clothing is overshadowing your character, then I think you're going too far. Um, But I think that's like, that's quite extreme to do that. I think you have to go more extreme than people think, Um, especially because it depends on what school of thought you go by. Like, for example, I go by the Italian school where it's like the rules aren't as rigid, like the, you know, the British tailoring uh, philosophy is all about blending in, you know, and, and, conforming to something whereas the italian it's more dressing to reflect yourself and your individuality right so i I definitely go more by that but i think there is a kind of balance of like okay sometimes it, it, it like everything it can go too far and you have to go towards a level of respect but finding where that is is very difficult i think it's very difficult um but it shouldn't be too restrictive like I said, I'd already by dressing the way we do, we're already making a statement. So it's like, so be it. So be it. Yeah. You know, you said something interesting in there. So you were suggesting that it's possible for someone to dress in such a way that they, you said specifically overshadow their character. What did you mean by that? And could you give like an example? Yeah. So a lot of times I, I really do believe mostly clothing does reflect our personality, right? Uh, either on a conscious level or a subconscious level. Um, Once it's conscious and you're consciously aware of the power of clothing, then you can either, two things can happen. You can specifically wear things that you want to physically manifest about yourself. And then they become more exaggerated because you're more aware of them. So like, let's say my Italian um, or my Sicilian and Greek heritage, right? If I want to, if I want to really profess that, I start dressing a little bit more Mediterranean, a little bit more mm-hmm. Italian, right? And then you might, because of that, you might start because you're more aware of it. You're wearing that. So you become a little more aware of it. So it can become more focus. Uh, like something that's a little stronger about your personality. It it really can. Um, But if you understand this, you can also go the other way and start deceiving. Right. And it can, or you can do a fake until you make it dress a way that you want to be like it. it, There is an act of like where you dress who you are and who you want to be. Right. Mm -hmm. But then there's some people that can use it to deceive people um, and dress in a way to look presentable when they're really not. Or like, um, I think of, for example, like a lot of uh, jobs these days where they tell you, you know, we're, the dress code is, is, is much more casual now because we want your customers to be like in a bank now. They're, they're even in banks, you know, they don't want people dressed because we want you to be approachable and more friendly and on their level, but you're not on their level. 
You're dealing with mm. their money, you know? <laughs> so it's like before it was more representative of the position. Now it's hierarchy. not. Yeah, the hierarchy. It was being aware of it. And now it's fooling people. That's not true because it, it, it's bullshit to say that, you know, it's like, oh, you're uh, to be more on their level. No, you're not. You're dealing with their money. You know what I mean? And so it's like you're, or you're rather you're dealing with whether in some instances, whether they get access to money. Exactly. So it's like you have the upper hand there. So it, it, instead of lying about it, be honest about it. And two, I think when you dress that way, it can really make you feel more like you have a responsibility and then you like feel more responsible and that you have a duty. Um, at least that's what it is for me. I feel like I actually have a duty. Um, when I dress more um, with authority, so to speak, or more adult, I guess you would say in a very millennial fashion, I'm, I'm adulting today. No, um, (laughs) (laughs) but like, if you know, you feel that responsibility. And so you start to bring that on because you're dressed in that. Um, And kind of like a king wearing its kingly garments, you know, his like, if he's robed in his kingly garments you know he feels that responsibility and he takes it on or he abuses it but some people fake it and i i see some people especially in the i don't want to call anyone out in particular but there's a lot of people especially in the instagram world that dress a certain way and you meet them and you're like you are nothing how you present yourself like Mm -hmm. whether it's in clothes or your pictures it's like they present themselves with this like authority and sophistication and then either they're not sophisticated at all and they're very um uh very immature or they're just very timid and like huh like afraid to even talk to you and you're like my guy you don't you know what i mean you present yourself in such a different way and either and so i don't want to say that they're specifically doing that maybe they just they're faking it till they make it and they haven't made it yet. Um, and in that case, I'd recommend tone it down a little bit. And it's kind of like working out. You go up incrementally. You don't just you know start deadlifting 400 at the first try. So just incrementally go up. Um, but sometimes it might be actual deceiving. So I guess that's what I mean by, you know, they're not dressing for kind of themselves and their enthusiasm, so to speak. Yeah, I guess uh, there is a certain balance there, as you are suggesting, because everybody at some point, when you get involved in menswear, you are to a certain extent an imposter. And Mm -hmm. that's just a natural function of you moving into a sphere that you don't understand, right? Right. So, I mean, the first time I wore a sport coat, I felt like an imposter. Now I can wear a sport coat and I feel just like myself. You know, yeah. so there's going to be, as you suggest there, a period of adjustment, the period where you feel like an imposter and eventually you can kind of like grow into it. But then it yeah. seems like there's even like the further stage, like after you don't feel like such an imposter where you start to develop a kind of unique style, which is where yeah. I'm starting to get to. But it's somewhere where I think that you've actually arrived at because you have a very distinct style. And I would even say that as far as I can tell anyway, it's very informed. What I mean by that is not only that you understand the principles of menswear, such as they are, but you also have a sense of heritage, which is very fascinating Mm -hmm. to me. You have a sense of what you wear and how it's reflective of where you and your family have come from. To what extent do you think that that is important for a person in developing out their unique personal style? Actually, I think that's, I think it's very underrated. I don't think when it comes to heritage, at least. So like, you have to find something that you're proud of, and that you have to realize that you every time you walk outside that you're an ambassador for your family, your country, your beliefs, I've heard some people say that no, I'm not I just represent me. No, you don't whether you like it or not you if you meet, let's say a foreigner, and you're disgraceful, and you're American and you're talking to someone that's not American, then, you you know, in a way that's going to inform their opinion on Americans, so to speak. Yeah. So you are an ambassador of all those things. So you have to dress like one and you have to figure out what is most valuable to you that you want to, what do you value the most and that you want to profess without speaking? What do you want to physically manifest about yourself that normally isn't physically manifested or that, people wouldn't would normally you'd have to tell them and you before you 
speak to them, would you like them to kind of see about yourself? And for me, I find heritage very important. I think I've, cause I've seen, and I talked about this on the podcast uh, just recently, how I think a lot of people may have an identity. They don't even, some people don't realize how much of an identity crisis they have because they don't know their roots or they don't hold on to traditions or that have been passed down. They've abandoned them. And I think at least for me, I find it extremely important, maybe because I'm very proud of them. I'm also part Lebanese and those traditions go way, way back, you know, like the Dabki dance that uh, I love doing Dabki dance. And that's from the Canaanite era. I mean, that's Bronze Age, like at least 3000 years old uh, dancing tradition. Um, the Seda, the Perigios Greek dance, that's from the Iliad, goes all the way back to the Iliad. So it's like it, it's it's easy for me to say very proud of this heritage, but you don't have to go that far back, you know, mm. uh, but I think it is important because in a way it is part of your identity and your family overall, a broader extension of your family. Um, and so I choose to, and, and because my, my worldview is very much in tune with the, it, cause it's part of my paradigm. So, right. So I'm not a, what you'd call postmodernist. I'm, uh, I'm Orthodox and I'm very much into the old world and the old world way of thinking. So uh, pre-enlightenment, you would say. So definitely I like to showcase that. And I think it's important. So like, let's say, for example, um, I realized that the trousers I like, I don't think it's a coincidence. They look like the traditional Greek vraka or the or the same style of pants that traditional Lebanese men wore with a really high like waistband, like almost cummerbund like kind mm -hmm. of um, quite baggy. And then they taper down or they, you know, would tuck them into their boots, um, their breeches. So it would create the same silhouette that I kind of have the large, like three inch waistbands, you know, single pleated, and then they're kind of roomy and then they taper down to the ankle and it, and actually my, uh, instructor for Byzantine chant. He's from Greece, Demetrius. And he was like, those look like Greek Varaka. One day I was wearing them at church and he's like, those look like Greek, traditional Greek Varaka. And I said, yeah, they do. They, they do. And so it's kind of, to me, that became part of the reason to wear it. It's, it's tradition, right? It's kind of like holding on to that or embracing that heritage, so to speak. Mm. So I do think it is kind of important, but really for me, the heritage part's important, but again, it depends on what you value most and what you want to showcase. Just find out what those are and then uh, start to find ways of incorporating that into your personal style. It's a way to hold on and profess them. It can even be as something as simple as a lapel pin or a signet ring with something with a symbol on it of some organization you're a part of or something you care about. So it mm -hmm. can be as simple as that, you know? Yeah. In addition to heritage, what do you think is important for someone developing their own individual style? So like what, what advice would you give to someone who is seeking to develop out a unique style other than to pay attention and incorporate where possible elements of their heritage? Know thyself, I guess you could say. Really, if, it, if you're developing- it's very your Greek system, of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it really is- um, if you, cause style is your way of putting things together, right? It's your individual style. It's part of you. So you have to know yourself. And so aside from learning basic rules, right? Know where you want to be. What, what do you want yourself to be like? And then start dressing towards that. But in, like we said before, there's a bit of going above and dressing how you are and also who you want to be, aspire to be just slightly up. And then you can keep going up from there, like building up your, um, your bench, right? Uh, if you're working out, it's kind of the same thing. So aside from heritage, it's just finding who you are, your, your greatest attributes about yourself, finding what those are and dressing to show the best parts of you. I think that's pretty much uh, what I would say. It's really figure out who you are and what you value and then dress in a way that shows that value. Hmm. I see. So I want to make a somewhat hard segue 
or transition now to talking mm-hmm. about your YouTube channel. So you talked a little bit about your motivation for creating the YouTube channel, which was your kind of first experience in inspiring your classmate who took inspiration from the way that you were dressing and started being more intentional about the way that he dressed. So how long have you had your YouTube channel? So I started, it technically went live uh, 4th of July, 2018. Um, Mm. So I've been doing this for quite a bit um, or not quite a bit. And some people have been on for like over 10 years, but um, it feels long because I, I dedicated my life to it. So it's like a year went by so much slower every year, which is actually quite nice. Um, but I, I wanted to get into YouTube uh, like when I was 15. So like to over a decade ago, well over a decade ago. And it was like, I, I was already thinking of doing commentary channels and testing things out and stuff and being kind of a comedic channel. And then I just went and never fleshed out. And then, yeah. So my friend did it and I went, okay, if I'm going to start a channel though, my whole thing was if I'm going to do a channel, I realized how overset, hugely saturated menswear channels were. There were so many of them. And I didn't realize at the time, and I'm glad I didn't, because I don't think I would have started it, that uh, menswear was a trend, right? There, there's like trends in YouTube and what gets popular and what people do. And menswear was a trend at the time, and now it's not. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean you can't grow. But I knew that if I want to stand out, I have to give, I have to do something different and give people value where the other people aren't giving it, whether that be in a different opinion than everyone else has or a different style than anyone else has. And I went, why can I do both? Because generally I take a contrarian view, right? Or I like the little details that people normally don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So I went, okay, that's one. And then I can't help myself, but make something, challenge myself with the craft of filmmaking, I have to. So, and I love doing it and I love pushing myself as hard as I can with it. So this gave me almost, you could say an excuse to practice because otherwise I wouldn't, you know, it's like uh, the the times I practiced was when I had assignments in school and then it was the YouTube channel. And so I went Mm -hmm. like, so for the longest time with the channel, I, um, I focus on one particular thing. Let's say it was a sound design. I bought a sound effect effects pack and i went okay i'm gonna use all music and all sound effects from this sound effect pack and really manipulate the sound to see it and master it so instead of practicing and then putting in a video the video will be my practice of this thing and so by the time i was done with a video it was a video on addressing monochromatic i used just the sounds and music that came from the sound effect pack and i mastered it in one video and i went cool then the next video it's like okay uh colored lighting with you know like lgb colored lights right okay let's let's do that and then i did a video with that okay maybe haze in this one okay uh certain music with this and then finally by the time i got to the dopia video i did on this the shirt it was like i put all that stuff all that i learned from all the other videos and i put it into one so mm-hmm. it, it it's kind of with the youtube channel it's like it, it it's kind of an outlet for me to to really not just help people and finding their style, but also for myself and to challenge myself with filmmaking and be the, try to make myself the best I can possibly go by doing it alone. So yeah, Mm. it it can be frustrating though. Like it's super frustrating, but uh, yeah, definitely. uh, But yeah, with, with my friend, uh, Eric, that was definitely the point where I went, okay, this is worthy of doing YouTube because before thinking of a comment, like a channel where I comedically complain about things, I want, I don't want to say that I spent my life doing that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I was like, I, cause I, I really did go, okay, is it going to be worth it? By the time I die, I go, what did I do to help? You know, I, I, I yeah. yeah, it's like, no. So I, I, when I got to do something, if it helps me and I can help other people, then that's something worth pursuing. And mm-hmm. then, because it's totally changed my perspective on things. It, um, it really, I was like, okay, this is a noble endeavor, at least something worth pursuing. So, right. yeah. So we were talking a little bit before we actually started the interview about what your kind of process is like. So for those who maybe are just starting a YouTube channel or who maybe are thinking about starting a YouTube channel, could you kind of like uh, flesh that out a little bit? So what's kind of your process for making your videos? Ooh, so 
first you got to figure out whether you're a quantity over quality or quality over quantity person because that will change the way you totally go about this i'm a i'm someone who would rather take not upload as much but make sure that if i upload something it's a banger right make it something that's worth the wait um and what you want to do though it, it's really nice to be organized and come up with a bunch of ideas beforehand to talk about right um, now I just started doing things the right way. This is the, the next video coming out. It's the first time I thought of the title first and that like fleshed out what the title was going to be and made the video about the title versus doing the whole thing and then going, shoot, what's the title going to be? What's the thumbnail going to be? Uh, <laughs> Cause, uh, that those two things are important and I really need to work on those, but really, it's really hard to say because there's so much involved in it. You know what I mean? There's so much involved in, in starting a YouTube channel, but really figure out first, you got to know that you got to be into what you're talking about or else you're never, you're going to burn out really quick. Um, because even I went through a ton of burnout and it's like, and I love doing this and I love talking about it, but you really got to love what you're talking about. I think, um, depending on how much effort you put into it, but think of, remember that you're not making it for you. The, the, I think the, the biggest important things you have to remember, at least, are you're not making it for you and no one gives a shit about you. <laughs> Unless you're famous, no one gives a shit about you. And so you have to make people care about you. Mm. And you know what I mean? You have to earn that. That's something mm -hmm. you have to earn. So don't you have to start earn off people's with, trust yep, and time. Yep, right? If people yep, are going to spend exactly. time listening to you, they have to yeah. trust you. Yeah, it's not Instagram where a like could just be someone flicking through like super quick and then missing. They're taking time out of their precious day. There's billions of videos to watch and they choose to watch yours and to take time into listening to you. So give make that time worth it for them because everyone's busy. And so don't do a vlog about your life because if no one knows who you are, why would they spend their already vlogs? I think it's like, I don't watch any vlogs of even famous people. Cause I'm like, look, I have my own life to care about. I'm not going to watch somebody else's man. And they're like, well, their life is cool. I want to, I'm going to make my time making my life cool. So <laughs> yeah. just watching theirs. I'm going to make my life freaking cool. So, uh, but especially if no one knows who you are, why would they spend their time, you know, looking at on your daily life you can show little things but not like a vlog like you know like uh, some of these other famous guys are doing don't do it um or you have to earn their the respect and you have to earn their trust and uh make their time worth it and sh they have to leave going wow i did not know that or that was cool like you know it's got to be something like that it's got to give them food for thought or something where they're like that was great like coming out of a great movie in a theater. That was freaking awesome. I want to go and buy another ticket. You know, so you have to do one of those two things. And remember that pre if you nail pre-production before you start filming, then filming will be a lot easier and everything else will be smoother. Nail that pre-production. If you're the kind of guy who needs a script, write it down. That's how I am. If you're not, maybe bullet points. Or if you're like Robert, you just wing it and you're gifted like that. Screw you. You're so lucky. Um, but if you are, awesome. But plan things out and make sure that everything in the frame is intentional. It's like a film. Every, it, when you watch a movie, everything in the frame is intentional. Every camera movement is intentional. And let the same be for your YouTube videos. Everything that you show has to have some intention or else it's just wasted space. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure you really um, know how to edit, get your pacing right. And little things like cutting out the little pauses in between cuts and making sure that when you cut a shot, that you're talking right after makes the pacing way better and way easier to listen to. And um, yeah, keep people interested and talk about something that they either, if it's going to be something that they know about a different angle on it or show them something really cool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's so much to go into. There's so <laughs> they, like that we could go down a YouTube rabbit hole, man. There's so much to talk about. It, it's, it's amazing though. Trust me, if you put your, I'll just end with saying, if you, if you really love it and you put your heart and soul into it, it'll be the most fun thing ever. And even when you're stressed out and even if you're going to be edgy and punch drywall uh, because you're frustrated with how things are going, 
know that you know what you still have this freedom and it's enjoy it enjoy it if you don't enjoy it don't do it but if you enjoy it greatest thing ever so yeah yeah so speaking more to your particular kind of youtubes uh needless to say anybody who's watched your videos will know that they're extremely distinctive because they do have that cinematic quality which is of course representative of your education in film school. So when you're going to craft a video, like how do you go about deciding, I don't even know that I have the technical jargon that's appropriate for this conversation, but how do you go about deciding how it is that you're gonna construct your little style movies, if you will? Yeah, so usually it's, it depends on the topic. Like like I recently, like the Dopia, review it's more like a short film it doesn't even have to be a review it's like a short film right it it depends it kind of comes just to my head like uh, i might be inspired by something like i thought it would be appropriate for this dopia shirt it's an italian knit so i went okay it's italian knit i can make this like a scorsese film right like a little homage to martin scorsese um and so uh but it's usually like I don't be a little know. bit more it, specific there. So when you make it like a Scorsese film, what does that mean technically? So, like what do you do in the in, in your your videos? So I one, I try to make it like a short film. So I'm not talking directly to the camera. I'm, you know, if I'm talking, it's a uh, voiceover, right? So I do mm-hmm. voiceover work. I make sure that everything is lit like a film. So, uh, you know, I, I really think intentionally about the scene. You have to go a little bit more into it. Every shot you have to either you can make a storyboard. I don't. Everything's in my head. So I like I know what it's going to look like when I'm thinking about it. Like so if like with the W video, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then the shot's going to look like this. And then that's going to look like that. And then I'm going to have this kind of style music in the background. Right. So I when I'm filming. I do little things that make it look like a film, let's say. So I'll make sure that the lighting is on point. The color correcting is a, the color grade is a big thing because uh, in film, it's different than what you see on YouTube. Don't get fooled when people say on YouTube, they give tutorials how to make things look cinematic. It's never cinematic. When they say cinematic, it's more professional what they're talking Mm. about because it's not what you see in movies. As funny as that sounds, because they tell you, make it really contrasted, the bright's really bright, the dark's really dark, whereas in film, if you actually looked at a a chart of the lighting in a film, it's very, um, it's not that bright. Like the brightest parts are not that bright unless it's like blown out areas like in a window, but like skin tones are really low. The coloring, like a lot of times it's very uh, yellowish or Mm -hmm. orangish. So the skin is like orange, orange, but it looks right because it's in a film. So I don't be afraid to make the skin look quite orange because it's like, that's just like, that's just a style that you'll see a lot like in um, Quentin Tarantino and stuff. So uh, I add film grain. So I add like the actual film grain to make it look like it was shot on film. I do little things. I, I, I don't want to give away too many secrets, but I do add no, a little okay. bit. Of, yeah, shake. Uh, I do add a little bit of shake um, to like mimic Like, you know, when you see like in film, like the title, if it's in a 90s film, you'll really see like the title kind of jittering around and shaking from the film. I add like a, a, we might cut this out, might not, but uh, I, 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 these the Patreon secrets. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I I add a little bit of shake to the whole thing. So there is a tiny little bit of camera shake I put in post to make it look like film. Mm. Um, I, I usually, you don't have to, because not all film is in anamorphic, but I like to do the, you know, widescreen, make it nice, like an anamorphic, uh, shine on an anamorphic lens. Uh, just tiny little things like that. Um, but really, you have to get the ethos of, match the ethos. It, it's kind of hard to say, but a lot of it, it, it really is hard to say, because it's all in my head. It just kind of, kind of just, I just do it. Like, I, I, I when it comes to like my film style, I, it's just kind of like, what do I want to do now? I try to keep it like, I try to change it up every video or at least not keep it monotonous. So if I'm doing like a style analysis, I don't want to do a bunch of style analysis where I'm just sitting down reviewing a, a video. I don't want to do that like time after time after time. I want to just change it up. So it's like, okay, this video I'll make kind of, I'll be inspired by some YouTuber or some film and then go, Okay, I guess I can try and see that style and see if it works. Um, but 
yeah, it's really hard to say it's cause yeah, it's like Kramer. It's all in my head. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, at this point, it's probably like functionally an instinct for you because you've yeah. been working with film for so long. And you've also yeah. probably watched so much film and analyzed and digested particular director styles so much so yeah. that, you know, that's reflective in your own personal style in ways that you may not be completely conscious of, you know, for example, yeah. like I spend quite a bit of time reading and writing poetry and, mm -hmm. um, I think that I have something of a distinctive voice in poetry, but I bet if you like gave it to somebody who had read some of the same poets that I have read, they would probably be able to pick up some of those same kind of like techniques in the poems that I'm writing, even though I myself am not conscious of them. So exactly. it's kind of interesting the way that that's incorporated into your own unique artistic expression. Yeah. I actually talk about it and I like it's language. So it's kind of like when you're learning a language, you want to be immersed in, the air with you want to be immersed in that language you want to constantly hear it it's not just about like translating words right so like good gala or you know very poly you know it's like you want to you have to be immersed in people speaking it and then you get used to it and you get acclimated to it right you kind of assimilate and you want to do the same with films so with films it's like for me i try to watch only really really good films that i'd want that in uh, to be influenced by. Right. So mm -hmm. I try to stay away. I know I sound like a snob. I really try to nope. stay away from like B movies because it's like, or like Marvel movies. I don't watch the Marvel movies because on a cinematic standpoint, they might be entertaining, but it's like the McDonald's of filmmaking. So it's like, I don't want to be inspired by that. I don't want that to influence how I look at film. So I try to watch really, really good films that have good filmmaking which is why I cannot wait for this next Batman film. I mean, already the scenes that I've seen of it, I'm like, wow, this is real cinema here. One of the few times uh, superhero films get into that. Um, but so once you watch those movies, that's why I say, like, watch who you want to, uh, what you want to be like, because if you do, yeah, yeah. then then you get acclimated to that language, so to speak. And then it will become more second nature. You won't be translating. It'll just, it'll just happen like, like when you're learning a language, you don't translate it in your head. Once you really know it, the word kala means kala, but you know what it means, but you don't have to go kala means good in English. You don't need to do that. And it's the same thing with filmmaking or doing YouTube or poetry or even, or even uh, style. It's, yeah. it's the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You don't sound snobby whatsoever. I understand precisely what it is that you're saying because particularly for a artistic domain that you are very passionate about you want to make sh you you don't want to be ingesting so to speak material that is going to negatively influence your art or potentially right. taint it in some way like for example uh, you know a poet i use that term very very loosely here a yeah. poet that's <laughs> very popular at this point in time is a poet called ruby carr you may have heard of her before yeah. but she writes very simplistic mass marketed poetry and she's very popular particularly among young women and girls and it's like i tried to read some of that poetry and it was just so bad i was just like i don't want this to influence my writing whatsoever and so just much like with a, a diet where you want to try to predominantly have foods that are clean and the best possible that you can get organic free range etc cetera, etc cetera. Right? yeah likewise here you don't want to be ingesting material that's going to negatively influence it right and I see the thing you. yeah and it's very on on that it's very easy and this kind of goes with youtube too to go that route and go okay it's crappy but she doesn't care because she's trying to get the largest audience right and let's yeah. be honest it's like you're getting the not bottom of the barrel you're getting the lowest common denominator right to like it and people who wouldn't know good from bad right yeah. and they're just yes. oh that's yes. great right and so and you can i'm definitely more of the opinion of like kind of old world it's kind of old world where it's like it's not about getting the most people to be invested in your business or your youtube channel it's not about the numbers it's more like there's integrity there it's like i'd rather keep the integrity and be smaller even if you have to struggle a little bit for it, it, you'll be much happier with yourself if that struggle is worth it to keep your integrity and 
your principles or, you know, and, and keep the art. So let's say if you were going to open like a suit business, right. You know, it's like, yes, the best way to, or a, let's say a clothing line, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. You could do fast fashion with bad fabrics and go to some third world country and have some kids, you know, so for you have really cheap and then mass market to a bunch of teenagers who are into everything trendy and you, that you know is is not the best stylistic choice, but hey, it brings in the brings in the dough. You could do that, or you can struggle a little bit, but you'll be happy making your own, being a tailor, let's say, you know, and making your own suits by hand. And you know, yeah, you don't make you don't sell much, but you're happy doing it, and you're proud, mm-hmm. and you feel good about it because you're preserving craftsmanship, right? Yeah. And, and it's the same thing with uh, YouTube. It can be a craft. It can be an actual new modern craft, which is actual to me. I, I like to go by the old um, description of art, which is that it was uh, art was always functionable in the term that it's it's an action, right? The art, and we still do use it in a sense. It's the art of making something beautiful, right? The art of carpentry, the art of tailoring, the art of poetry or rhetoric or something like that. There's, Mm -hmm. it's linked with craft. And even the Greek word uh, techni is where we get tech, technology, but that means craft. That means art. So it's the same, it comes from the same word. Um, And it's something that I think should definitely be preserved, whether it be uh, quality YouTube videos or cigar rolling, or whiskey, wine making, or suit making, shoe making, uh, you know, blacksmithing, carpentry, whatever it is. And I, I definitely find I, you're into, are you a whiskey and cigar guy yourself? I am neither of those things. <laughs> really? Really? Okay. I drink right. wine. Though. I'm, I'm into wine, okay. but hey. I will say I'm uh, in no capacity a connoisseur. I, okay. I drink good wine, but by good wine, I just mean $13 organic hey, wine. That's me too. Name. Yeah. It's <laughs> vino though. It's good vino. You know, it's like, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's definitely something I've noticed. Like it, it's something that goes together, right? Like a lot of guys who are in the suits or sartorial life, it, we tend to like a lot of similar things. Not all of us. Right. But like there's similar things. And I was trying to realize why, I, and it's not just the culture of it. I think because there's something just about craft There's something conservative, to. I would say. Yes. And I don't mean mm-hmm. that necessarily in a political sense. I merely mean conservative in the sense that we have, in my experience, most of the people who are involved in menswear who are really passionate about have a certain kind of broad appreciation for yep. the past and yep. sort of a kind of yep. traditionalism. Although that's not that's not always the case. I haven't right. found always the case. Yeah, it, because some of the I know some people, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, or her, some of the fashion guys are very modern in their way of thinking. But then at the same time, a lot of them do appreciate, yeah, the past and uh, the culture of the past and traditions and the richness of it. Because I think it's it was super rich. You know what I yeah. mean? There's all there also seems to be like. There seems to almost always be, not always, but almost always be some kind of unique connection to the past in a particular yeah. domain. So like, let's just say, for example, in my case, I think it comes predominantly through literature because yeah. I teach English. And so I love literature going all the way back to the 1700s. And I think mm-hmm. like that kind of conservative in a broad sense, I think that that kind of manifests itself in Oh, not necessarily in the particulars of my style, but in appreciating classic style as such. Yeah. And I've noticed that that's the case in many of the people I've talked to who are involved in menswear, whether that be that they're like really interested in music, going all the way back to classic music, such as, for example, like Ethan Wong, if you are familiar with him on Instagram, mm-hmm. he yep. has a, a, a deep appreciation for classical music. And then, you know, if I look like my friend, uh, John Marks, the American traditional, like he's just very interested in kind of like history, the domain of study history. Yeah. But there seems to be something interestingly connected with those things that I don't necessarily understand very well. I think, too, because just the very idea now is that sartorialism is something that is a relic of the past that's holding on. But it's still, you you know, it's like everyone knows that you don't have to in most scenarios, you don't have to wear a suit. You don't have to wear a jacket. But if you do, that says something. And I think, again, it's not just because I mean, I think objectively suits can make a man's physique look incredible. 
right? Mm-hmm. There's little things about it, whether it be shoulders, the lapels, which can make your chest look bigger. And like, there is an art to it that is objective, but the subjective part I think too is why we're attracted to it is because it is something that is more a relic of the past. That's still acceptable today, but it's something mm-hmm. of a tradition that's been going on for, for in this day and age, quite long. You know what I mean? Everything moves. Yeah, so we're quick. probably it's, talking it's, about going back at least 300 years. Like yeah. we're looking at like the the sport coat. Of yeah. course, the the modern instantiation is very different from what you know, the right. riding jackets. You know, in the 1700s, of course, but you know, it still but has still, that kind of tie. Yeah, yeah, you still see it. Even when I was like looking at uh, traditional Greek clothing, it's like they have the vest, a double-breasted vest. They have a shirt. And it, the hilarious thing is I went with this look, like a, you know, with the collar over it and my usually my chest hair showing. Uh, <laughs> that's so, like, that's so old. There's these pictures of old, the uh, especially Odysseus, Odysseus um, of the Greek War of Independence, Odysseus. He, um, there's a portrait of him. It's like, you know, 18 something early 1800s and it's hilarious he's got a vest on a white shirt one piece collar mind you and it's flared over his vest and his all his chest hair showing because he has an unbuttoned like you know all the way down and i went man greek dudes have been rocking this look for like 200 years now <laughs> 200 over 200 years but it's um i don't know where the hell i was going with that <laughs> but you know it's like it, yeah where the hell was i going with that Something about traditional, just, yeah, just a relic of the past. And it's like, it's been going on for quite a bit, uh, uh, some of these styles. But, you know, it's just great. You know, you still see a, a bit of it. Even in the past, you can still see the relics of how it it can translate today. You see a natural evolution of it. And it's really nice to just kind of, usually, yeah, the people who are dressed in this way, they'll have something that they want to, that they're interested in that is a relic of the past definitely because yeah i don't i don't think i know anyone so far in this in this realm that doesn't appreciate at least one thing that is um considered from the past whether it be in music dance or you know philosophy school whatever it is there's always something something there that you have an appreciation for definitely definitely Mm, yeah so we are closing in on an hour and a half. It's getting a little bit late, but uh, what I wanted to do before we head out is ask you kind of a broad question. Sure. Um, so answer it how you will. But why in general do you think it is important for men to be concerned about their style? Wow. Why is it important? Because not only do you find out who you are and what you represent, but it brings about the responsibility that is lacking, especially today. You'll realize, I think if you know that, then you'll take yourself, I think, sometimes more seriously. And it doesn't mean, when I mean style, it doesn't always mean dressing like us, right? Like it can be if you have that rugged style and you're, if you're in the country, right, and you're a farmer, you know, I'm not telling you to dress up in a suit. But know your style, whatever that may be. I think it's important to knowing yourself, who you represent, what you represent, and the responsibilities that come with that. So I think it, whatever it is, if you're a rock star and you you, you dress like one, you're going to take on that responsibility of being a rock star, I think, more seriously than if you were just dressed like whatever, like you did before you were one, um, because of, where you don't care. Everyone does care about their style. Because a lot of the guys who say they don't, I told one of them, he's like, I don't care about my style. I said, all right, yeah, all right, go wear some women's leggings. He's like, no way, dude. Like, there you go. I kind you of feel about the same about that as like when people say, yeah. yeah, like, you know, I don't care what people think of me. It's like, like, you have to say that you don't care what people think about you because you are concerned about what people think of you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You can't get away from it. It's impossible. So it's inevitable. But it, to be intentional about it, I think is really important because again, and it can lead you to opportunities that you never would have thought possible. Um, I think it's great to learn, be the be a man, who, get you a man who can do both. You know, like when girls say that, it's true. <laughs> like be a guy who can do a lot of things. Like uh, I think it's important too, if you are do find yourself in a situation where a Ah, uh, you cut out there for a second. 
Oh, uh, shoot. Um, yeah, like if you, I think it's great to do both because then you can like, let's say, know that if you find yourself in a situation where wearing a suit would give you an advantage, learn how to wear one right. And then, you know, if you're in a, let's say a sketchy neighborhood, I used to live in Detroit. It's good to know how to dress when you're in that neighborhood, right? So it doesn't just mean just dressing nice. Just dressing intentional will benefit you in so many ways that you never thought possible. And it'll also make you self-reflect more and find out more about who you are as a person because it's going to force you to ask questions about yourself and that you might have not thought of before. And then that's when you really start to know who you are as a person. Mm. So with that said, for those who don't know where to find you, can you tell us where it is that we can find you? Yeah, you can find me at www.youtube.com slash Demetrius Levi. That is D-E-M-E-T-R-I-O-S-L-E-V-I. Or you can find me also at Demetrius Levi on Instagram. Uh, I recently started, I'm, I'm going to try and start um, posting more in, uh, inspirational outfits there uh most of it right now is junk let me just remind people like most of the photos in there of my style is before i really knew what i was doing but i'm going to start doing it again and you can that's where you can dm me or if you do want to shoot me a business email or anything like that it is demetrius levi at gmail.com so that's where you, you also find. have a patreon don't you yes oh my gosh thank you You're yeah. talk a little bit about <laughs> that plug that yeah um if uh because I like to keep my, because I don't want to, you know, be influenced by um, companies' thoughts and and have sponsors. I'm sponsor free, so I can give my full honest opinions on things, and that way I don't have to, you know, rush a video because a sponsor wants it out by a certain date. Um, I have a Patreon because I feel like that is the best way to support a channel that works in the way mine does. So you can find that patreon.com slash Demetrius Levi as well. I have a few tiers. Uh, the lowest tier, it's more for support. I also have live streams permanently on there that aren't permanent on the channel or extra videos that are going more into detail on something I talk about on the main channel. And then the upper tier um, is where I will teach, I do teach people my filmmaking secrets and things that you will not find either on YouTube or stuff I won't talk about in public um, about my uh, filmmaking secrets. And I also have a podcast on there called The After Party, where I talk a little bit about a little bit more edgy things, things about life in general or the crafts or the world and get a different perspective on that at the podcast. So if you want to support me there, I would greatly appreciate it because that is how um, I am able to continue to do this. So yeah, if you want to, that is patreon.com slash Demetrius Levi. All righty. And I'll make sure to link those down in the description below so you guys can access those. And with that said, uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for spending the Friday evening with me, such as it is. I uh, greatly appreciate it. Absolutely, dude. Thank you so much for having me. This is actually the first interview you're the first person to interview me so i am extremely humbled and honored and i absolutely loved it man this was so much fun so i appreciate okay. it dude thank you so much you're welcome so have a good evening all right you too brother